And so as the heat comes up, you realize that this is going to be the end. You crouch down in the lowest part of your office, probably get a towel from somewhere and you know, give it some moisture from the tap and put it over your nose, hoping that this, those acrid fumes will not come into your system. And just when you give up all hope, you call in your mind your spouse, your children, your loved ones and say goodbye. This is the end. The heat you can just feel. Just when you're thinking that, a fireman bursts into the room, kicks the door open and he says, Anybody here, follow me down this stairs, it is the only way out. What will you do? Let me first decide whether I will follow you. No. It is the most powerful motivating claim from that fireman to say, this stairway is the only way out. And that is what every founder of every religion said. This is the only path out. They didn't want us to go to university and get A's and B's and C's on a test. They wanted us to pull up our bootstraps and go the way they were telling you to go. None of them wanted anything else. Number six, it will dictate the type of search we will now do. See if there is just one way, then how far ahead should he be or she be? or that religion be. How far ahead is the 100 meters Olympic champion ahead by? Point zero zero one second sometimes and only he is champion, nobody else. You don't have to be so far ahead. That's one thing. Number two is if there is just one then when you look at four or five, the concept of one will dictate to you right away which one it might be, for example. We are looking for the correct colored marble. The correct colored marble. There are five green marbles and only one red marble. So which one is the correct colored marble? If we say there's only one, red. Because we've already decided there's only one. If every, we're, we're trying to decide which is the correct way to compete in this event. Everybody is running and this guy is walking. Which is the correct way to compete? If there's only one way to compete? Walking. Well, sometimes it's shiny and red, but let's look at another example. There are four shiny, beautiful red marbles and a stinky, dirty brown one. Which one is the correct one? The stinky, dirty brown one. Because the concept is there's just one. So what we look for then is any claim that is just going off by itself and not sticking with the rest. It might be up in front, Maybe way at the back. Doesn't matter. Are you with me? Okay. If any questions, you can write down your questions on the card and raise your hand if you do have one. With this concept, I went to five major religions and I chose these because these religions made the claim very clear, unequivocal, that they were the only way. Hinduism, the founder is not Vishwamitra. I've just put it down one of the authors of there. There are many, many authors. There's no one single founder. For example, the literature is the Rig Veda, Upanishad, the Bhagavad Gita, which is in the Mahabharata. Islam, Muhammad is the founder. Uh, Quran is the literature. Buddhism, Buddha, Buddhist writings. Christianity, Jesus, and the Bible, Judaism, Moses, and the law, and the prophets. And if you look at today, the study of the Torah, which is called Talmud, also is a part of the literature. Before I went to look at them, I realized that some of them were making big claims, impressive claims, saying that this is unique to their religion. But when I looked at another religion, they also made similar claims. It no longer was unique. Unique means just one. So I had to put those claims aside, 
because they would not help me find the one way. And there were 12 such factors, a complete message, faith and trust, picture of a savior God, incarnation, one supreme being, it is re revealed and not man-made, it's beyond logic and reason, realization, experience are essential keys, the goal is incredibly fantastic, blessings even in this present life, it is universal not just for the adherence of that faith, and number 12, presence of miracles, these are found in more than one. So I put all these 12 aside and looked at 10 questions. Three questions I addressed to the writings. Number one, what type of writing is it? Is it mythological? Is it legendary? Is it a folk tale? Or is it historical? Number two, does it throw out a challenge for itself to be tested in any form? Or does it say, it can't be tested, take it, swallow it, or throw it out. Don't try to test it at all. Number three is, can anyone describe a top feature of the writing? Those are the three questions I address to the writings. The seven questions after that were to the founders. What is the highest claim you make for yourself? What is your message and mission in a nutshell? And the third question to the founders was, to me, a real acid test, a real test. Did your life match your own teachings as a founder? Number four, what happened around birth time? Number five, how long was your ministry? How long did you take to make a statement to the world? And number six, to the founders, what was the circumstances at death? And final question, what happened after you died? So these ten questions we will ask all the five, pull out the responses from their writings or from a source that is friendly to that religion. That is the criteria. I did not go to a critique of the religion to pull out anything. And then I would not be able to state whether they are telling the truth or not. I could not. All I would do is ask the question, pull out the answer, and just lay it side by side and see what happens. When I started this, I, like any other person, you don't know what the outcome would be at that point. You don't know whether there will be any outcome. Maybe it's all one, some fuzzy, nebulous conclusion, which you can't even call a conclusion. Here it is, the first one. Classification of literature. Ancient literature is classified into folk tale, legend, myth, or historical. A folk tale, there is no attempt to state a real true story. The main intent is to be interesting and bring out a lesson or a moral. So it's very common that a folk tale or folklore, you will have birds talking together and the sun smiling, they're all personified, and the breeze whispering, and all the animals having a big committee meeting. They are not interested in telling you a real story. A folk tale, the story part, can be anything. When it comes to a legend, it's probably based on a real true story, but this is the key for a legend. Changes will creep in, exaggerations and embellishments to superhuman proportions, and the changes begin generations after the event when there are no longer any witnesses to challenge that change. That is the key of a legend. It is not possible to create a legend in the generation or two of the event. Because there are people around who will say, no, that, that's, that didn't happen. It's wrong. In fact, if you read some of the descriptions, and we talk about one or two generations, the description of uh, Gautama Buddha and some medallions that were carved out in memory of him, a 300-year-old medallion is called by historians fresh in the memory of the people. So we are talking about centuries. Time period to create a legend requires centuries, usually. Myth is so far back in history that it's generally accepted as somebody's imagination. The story is probably not true. The characters are probably fictitious. It usually involves the supernatural world and the time period to or the myth is usually many centuries and even thousands of years. Historical? 
The attempt is to state the story as it really was. There are no significant additions, no core changes. Remember, all ancient writings have changes. There is not a single ancient writing in which there is no changes at all. The question is, are there core changes that changes the intent of the story? That is what in a historical writing is really not so much in play. The closer to the event, the greater the credibility. Why did I go for this factor first? It is because of the credibility of the message. I am not saying that a mythological message is wrong. I am saying that a mythological message attached to a myth has less credibility than a historical piece of literature which is attached to a message. Because, for instance, a legend, if the story changed, I cannot vouch that the teachings also did not change. So it is not fixed, but it's just the level of credibility. Now with these words, let's look at the writings themselves. Hinduism, the Rig Veda is the earliest text followed by the next three Veda texts, and then an anthology which is known as the Upanishads, and then an epic or a big story which is called the Ramayana, the story of Rama and Sita, and then the Mahabharata in which is found the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita is the baby of their literature, the youngest one. Here's what they're saying. Lord Krishna first spoke Bhagavad Gita to the sun god some hundreds of millions of years ago. Now there's no way any of us can go back hundreds of millions of years to establish anything of that nature. But they do say it was lost to humanity and then came back again in what circumstances is called the Battle of Kurukshetra which is in the northern part of India and that was 50 centuries ago. Still a long ways away. Difficult to go back. And that is why some of the encyclopedias do call it a mythological story. Although it's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. All I'm saying is that it has a mythological flavor. Krishna is an avatar of Vishnu, the preserver of the universe according to Hindu mythology. Most scholars agree that those stories are mythological. Doesn't make the teachings wrong. Again, it just questions the whether there's any change in the teachings or whether they, they were original. Number two is Buddhism. Uh, there are four statements I'm going to make and they are chronological in terms of time. The first statement is the humanity of the Buddha was expressed by a Theravada monk. A Theravada was the, were the people, all the teachings, contemporary with Gautama Buddha. So when a contemporary monk spoke, he was talking about what he knew about the about Gautama Buddha personally. He said, was he not born at Lumbini? Did he not complete existence at Kusinara? In other words, he was just like you and me. He was born here, died here. But number two, soon after the passing of the Master, a change began to set in. At the beginning of the Christian era, that's now 500 years have gone by, the transcendental nature of the Buddha became more and more pronounced. Number four, in one of the most important pieces of Mahayana literature, now Mahayana is the next form of Buddhism, which came about 700 to 1000 years later. And in that, there is not much of the man left in the Buddha. He is now an exalted being who has lived for countless ages in the past and will continue to live forever.